Dan, I know that song. <laughs> Good morning. In our following on the Gospel of Luke, today we'll hear Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is no need of any one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. May God bless to our hearing and our understanding this reading from the Holy Word. Amen. Amen. Any kids want to come up? What's up, guys? What have I got here? There's a ping pong ball and there's like other balls, right? So they're balls, yeah? You think I can catch one ball, throw one ball up and catch it? Do you think I'm able to do that? Let's see. Yeah, all right. You think I can take two and throw them up and catch them? Yeah? Yeah? Not quite as easy. What about three? Uh, you're shaking your head out. Yeah, Alexander's like, oh, I've seen Mr. Tim. He's not. Yeah? Oh, ah, crud! Oh, man. Yeah, you were right. You were right. Now, so, can, can y'all catch one, you think? Can you throw one up and catch it? Yeah? Go ahead. Oh, nice. Got it. Got it, see? If you've got, if you got the one thing to worry about, it's pretty easy. You can keep it going. All right, let's put them back down here in the front of us, okay? Let's put them right here. Oh, go grab that one, Ben. So we need that. Yeah, go grab it. Thanks, bud. Oh, it's getting away from you. All right, put it right here. Put it right here. Awesome. So if we have just one thing, we can kind of keep it going, right? Do you, and so I don't know if you all ever feel this way, but you have like so many things going on that you might just feel overwhelmed or like there's too many things to worry about. Do you ever have that like going on where you feel like, ah, oh, I can't keep up with all the stuff that's happening right now? Well, it happens a lot as you get older. So it's, and so a lot of people, and a lot of people talk about this word called multitasking. Have you ever heard that people talk about multitasking? That you have lots of different tasks and you're doing them at the same time? The thing is, no, some people are better at it than others, but no one actually is a really good multitasker. Like, it's just no one's really good at doing lots of things at once. So having lots of things going on makes it really hard to keep them all up in the air. It's like, one, I can do. Two, I can do. If I start trying to juggle all these, I mean, even a practice juggler, what do they do? They throw one ball at a time, right? Just really quickly. So in the story today, did you hear that, how Martha is running around the house doing all this stuff? She's like trying to make dinner and get ready for all these guests she has in her house. And then her sister Mary sits down and just listens to Jesus teach. And Martha gets really frustrated with her sister and says, says to Jesus, Jesus, tell Mary to help me. Well, so Martha's got like all these balls that she's juggling and she can't keep up with them all, or doesn't feel like she can, and she thinks if her sister would just help her, she could, right? Like when all three of you had a ball, each of you could throw that ball and catch it just fine, right? Well, what Jesus says, says to Martha, well, you know what, Martha? All those things you're holding? You could just put them down. You could just put them down and find the one that matters, the way Mary has. Now, for Martha, it might have been like if Martha really did want to like cook dinner for everybody and she was having a good time doing that, Jesus probably wouldn't have said, stop cooking dinner. But she's getting worried because she's, she's trying to balance all these different things that all these different people have told her she needs to do, right? Like she has all these things. It's like if you're trying to play a video game and your mom's like, clean your room. 
And your dad's like, are you going to take out the trash? And then you might be like, you know, your friend's like, hey, are you going to get on that uh, Twitch thing and watch this video with me? And you're like, I can't do all of it. I can't do all of it. And so Jesus says, pick the one thing that's most important and do it. And at that moment, for Mary, the most important thing was sitting and listening to Jesus teach. And he said, that's great. Take your one ball and throw up and down and focus on it. And if Martha had wanted to do that or if she wanted to cook, but she sort of wanted to do several things and couldn't handle them all. And Jesus says, don't focus, don't try to do everything. Pick the one thing that's most important at that moment or the thing that has to be done at that moment and do it. So I hope you guys are able, how do you, how do you think we might be able to figure out what the most important thing is? Christians like us might have a different answer than other people. Although I do this, I make a list each week. I make a list of what things, and each day sometimes, what I need to get done that day. But as Christians, and one thing I actually do while I'm making my list, who do you think I try to listen to? God and Jesus. I try to listen to God and Jesus. And sometimes that's tricky, but there are ways we do that. And I hope that you might talk about that some during your Sunday. I know you talk about that during your Sunday school classes, and at VBS we talked about it. How do we pray and listen to Scripture and how do we follow the different lessons so we can find the light? And so those are things that we try to do as Christians. And all of us, even those of us who are a lot older than you guys, are always trying to figure out how to figure out what is that one thing God needs us to do right now and how to simplify it, figure out what it is we need to do so we can keep that one ball going and not have three balls thrown in the air we can't catch. Thanks, guys. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for Jesus, who reminds us that your way is not the busy way, but the better way for us to live. Thank you and amen. All right, you guys, go, and go to children's worship with Miss Ruth, if you like. And have fun, and we'll sing this little light of mine while you go. I'm gonna let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. So this is the last Sunday of this sermon series we've been doing on being a church in bloom. We started with Pentecost Sunday. Oh, I messed up. There's, yep, sorry, Chris. I told you there was a cue there, and there wasn't. I, I edited at the last minute. I meant to tell you that. Sorry. So we started with Pentecost Sunday, and this is fine. We talked about all the ways we answer God's call in the world, the way that the Spirit speaks to us, the way the Spirit tells us how to be a church that's alive with God's light and God's love, the way we live into our call, we call it, as a church. We talked about being a church that asks questions, about being a church where it's a safe place for healing to happen, being a church that welcomes all people, especially those who haven't traditionally been welcomed in churches, and a church that serves people both around the world and here locally. And how can we do all this as a church? Well, first of all, if you're feeling overwhelmed, I see us doing this already. I'm not really giving us a laundry list of things we need to do, we should do. What I'm saying is these are things I see us doing, things I do believe make for a healthy, blooming church. And the question, as always, is how do we keep moving forward? How can we continue to go forward into an uncertain and even frightening future? Because anxiety and fear and worry are the biggest obstacles in life. Let me say that again. Anxiety and fear and worry are the biggest obstacles in life. As human beings, we have overcome enormous challenges and come out on the other side of catastrophe over and over again, going all the way back to beyond the times of history, to things we don't even know about today. And I say that because we are in the middle of a host of challenges right now, and I don't need to tell you that. 
But still, the biggest obstacles are how we respond to these challenges. A lot of the worst things we see happening today are actually caused, I believe, by human anxiety as much as by the actual challenges we face. I believe that that includes war and climate change and racism and all the other manner of, manners of evil we see around us. People act out of anxiety. It seems simplistic, but I believe, and I have believed for a long time, even before I was a Christian, really, and kind of my thoughts about that affirmed what I heard Jesus saying, that a great deal of human evil has anxiety as a key ingredient. If we could let go of our fear, we'd be able to act in a much more life-giving, loving way. The way that anxiety and fear come up in our day-to-day -day life is worry. And let me just say at the very beginning that I am a very experienced and accomplished worrier. So in this message, I don't want you to feel shamed if you have worries. It is natural to worry. I am, as a therapist once told me, you're a worrier. I was like, really? That's how you're going to define me? Okay. So, but with all these crises in our world, it's easy to worry. It's even understandable. And I know beyond the crises in our world, each of you, each of us, brings our own concerns with us this morning. Health, money, relationships, even that anxiety, anxiety about how do we do the right things in our life? How do we respond to those individual situations? And the big questions, what can I do? So when we feel overwhelmed by it all, what do we do? Well, let me give you something else that sounds simplistic and maybe trite, but hopefully you'll realize I don't mean it that way. What I'm going to tell you is that we listen to Jesus. But of course, our story today in which someone listens to Jesus is not about a situation of global proportions. Instead, the story we heard today is a family drama. Martha welcomes Jesus into her home. Her sister sits at Jesus' feet, which is the description used in the ancient world, not just in the Bible, but in texts around the ancient Near East and even throughout Greek culture. It's this description used for a student learning from a teacher. And Martha gets frustrated that Mary isn't fulfilling, fulfilling her normal duties as a woman of the household, leaving Martha to do all the work. Their friend, the guest, responds. So this is a very small story in a way. It might just be that there's only three people involved in the story. And yet it isn't a small story because of who the guest is. So this family argument has something to teach us today about how to respond, whether we are struggling with global or national or individual problems, even just things in our interpersonal relationships. And that answer is the key to how we will move forward into the future, both as individuals and a church, not with anxiety, but with trust and hope, and even maybe joy and excitement too. So first, let me point out a few things about this story of Martha and Mary, because this story has been used to essentialize both women and also the idea that there are two ways to be a disciple of Jesus, the doer and the listener, where in fact, John pointed out in his prayer, I didn't even give him notes about this, we are both Martha and Mary, we're both doers and listeners, servers and those who are served by hearing. And so often, uh, as humans, we smuggle shame into this story. I say we smuggle shame into this story. We use it as a way to shame people. I say we smuggle shame in because Jesus does not do that to his friend Martha. Jesus does not tell Martha she's doing anything wrong. When he says you are worried and distracted, he doesn't say she's distracted by things which aren't good. Hospitality in their day and age was one of the most important values, maybe like the core value of their culture. Treating a guest with honor and respect, making sure they had plenty to eat and were completely taken care of, was the prime mark of your morality as a person in the ancient Near East. And the Bible over and over holds up this value as important. From Genesis, when Abraham and Sarah welcome three angels into their camp, 
to the way people welcome Jesus to their homes over and over again. Scripture tells us that what Martha is doing is a basic good. Martha is doing exactly what she should be doing. According to the customs of the era, Mary is actually the one who is out of bounds. Women did not learn from rabbis. Teachers of many traditions, even those from outside of Jewish culture, didn't take women as students. It just wasn't done, which I'm sure is something you've heard about from your cultures, wherever you've come from. That's just not how it's done. So we need to be clear that Martha is on some level justified. Based on her context in being frustrated with her sister, we can understand her. So Martha has gotten a bad rap. But why doesn't Jesus side with her and tell Mary, go get in the kitchen? Well, for one thing, Jesus has already shown he isn't interested in the gender norms of his era, forcing people to do what they are supposed to do. Jesus welcomes not just Mary of Bethany, which the town is where they are as Bethany, as we find out in John's Gospel, not just this Mary, but other women to come and learn from him. Women support his ministry. Women like Martha. And Martha herself is already unique for a woman of her time because she has her own home. The first sentence of our scripture today reveals a lot. In verse 38, it says that as they were traveling along, they came to a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed, her, welcomed them into her home. Do you remember way back in the spring, we talked about Luke for several weeks. We talked about Jesus wandering around teaching the crowds, these crowds that would crush in on him. And I kept reminding us that most of Luke is a travel story. For most of this gospel, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, where, of course, he will be crucified. Jesus, Luke says, set his face towards Jerusalem. And Luke even says that Jesus isn't welcomed many places because he has made this choice. Jesus' focus on his mission, and we can extrapolate from that probably the truth-telling he's doing about the powers that be in his world, makes him an unappealing guest to many people. But not to Martha. On this journey, he is welcomed by his friends, Martha and Mary, into Martha's home. And that wasn't normal for a woman to be in charge of the home. It's in most contexts, a man welcomes into the home. The man is in charge. Again, this is, a Masa, this is a patriarchal culture, right? Men are on top. Jesus, again, is breaking down those expectations. Was Martha a widow? Did her parents pass on their estate to her even though she was their daughter and not their son? She's able to keep a household of her own. This is very unique in her day and age. So like her sister and like their friend Jesus, Martha defies the gender norms of her day. Martha is willing to host this radical, boundary-crossing rabbi into her home. But then she lets her sense of duty get in the way of recognizing the moment for what it is. So let's just pause for a moment. Just stop for a moment and remember what's actually happening here. Martha has welcomed the Messiah into her home. Martha's home in this moment contains the human incarnation of God. The greatest divine mystery of all time is sitting in her house teaching. And Mary recognizes this moment for what it is. But Martha gets caught up by what she should be doing. Again, Anxiety takes over. So often we are worried and distracted by what the world around us tells us to do. Our anxiety doesn't come from within us, but from other people's expectations. I think in this moment, Jesus isn't chastising Martha for cooking and cleaning. I think what he's doing is inviting her to let go of her anxiety so she can recognize the power of the moment in front of her which is exactly what Jesus says over and over again throughout this Gospel of Luke and all of the Gospels. And in fact, for the next three weeks, we're going to talk about 
abundance and worry and anxiety and how we can live a life of abundance. Maybe Martha is especially sensitive to being a good host or hostess, which in that era and even in modern Palestinian families means the women cook a big meal and they don't sit down until the guests, with the guests until all the food is finished and on the table. And that's not unlike a lot of the older generation of women in my families of origin. It's an expectation. And we know there are people, we know there are people who love to cook and to host guests and find great joy in that. I'm actually one of those people. I love to be in the kitchen making stuff, cooking, making sure everyone's got a drink, everyone's happy. But Martha, we can tell, isn't finding great joy in that. Instead, she's finding anxiety. She wants to honor Jesus. She wants to welcome him. But her anxiety drives her to worry and distraction instead of joy. Mary follows her joy and sits at Jesus' feet. I sincerely believe that if Martha was happily bustling about, honestly finding joy in serving Jesus by baking bread and making sure there were enough cushions for all the guests, Jesus wouldn't have said anything to her. He's not judging their choices. He's pointing out the reality of their reactions. Martha is worried and distracted. And do you notice Jesus doesn't say, I expect there to be a big meal when we get there. Jesus never puts the expectation on Martha. I think Jesus would say, don't worry. We'll eat the leftover bread and whatever else you have lying around. And we also know from another story in Luke that's told elsewhere that Jesus could even provide a feast for them if he wanted. So Jesus doesn't need Martha to cook this meal. He's not putting that shame and expectation on her. So I think, what I think the lesson is that we can take from this story today, that Jesus points out Martha's anxiety, not her behavior. He's pointing out her anxiety, not her behavior. Jesus tells Martha, in essence, stop shooting yourself. Have you heard this before? It's one of the most life-giving lessons I've ever learned, or that I'm really still trying to learn. It's basically just be careful about that word, should. Ask, who is it that's actually saying it to you when you hear it inside your head? Is it a legitimate voice? Because often, maybe even usually, it comes from an outside source that doesn't actually hold any authority for us. And those voices distract us from the voice of Jesus, from the voice of the Holy Spirit, which, of course, the Spirit is how Jesus speaks to us. It's that still, small voice that's mentioned in the book of Kings. We hear about that a lot. We can't hear that still, small voice if we listen to all the shoulds around us. And we can do that as a church, too. Sometimes churches think they should do everything, meet every need, engage in every possible good ministry. But thankfully, we are just one church within the universal body of Christ. Even here in Valparaiso, we are one church, and there's lots of other churches around, all trying to serve Jesus, I hope. Like Mary and Martha, we aren't all the same. They were individuals. They weren't archetypes. They were Jesus' actual friends, actual women who lived their own unique individual lives. We aren't all the same. That's true of us as individuals, and it's true of individual churches. We each can follow the voice that we hear when we sit at Jesus' feet. So the, king, the key thing for us is to find ways to listen for God's voice. And yeah, we do that in prayer. We do that in reading Scripture. We do that by reading authors or listening to speakers or podcasters who help us understand all of this. But we also, we also sit at Jesus' feet when we spend time with our fellow Christians. What do we say? When two or three are gathered in his name, 
he is present. We say we are the body of Christ. Each of us is in Christ. The word that Christians comes from in Greek literally means little Christs. Each of you is a walking, talking embodiment of Jesus. And so when I spend time with a group of other Christians, I'm sitting at Jesus' feet. So as a church, it's crucial that we spend time together in small-sized groups where everyone can at least be heard and listened to. Even if folks are not the most talkative, a small group is a chance for the less talkative to speak and be heard, and their voices matter. Talking about where we hear God's voice speaking into our lives, because then that collective vision, that collective vision we start to get kind of filters up into the whole congregation. And we start to say, oh, there might be a ministry that's my ministry, and I go off and do that. But what is the ministry of my church, this particular congregation? What is the thing we are called to right now? Because we can't do everything, or else we'll try to do everything and not do it well. So those small groups are really important, and they're important for a lot of other reasons too, because they're really life-giving and wonderful ways for us to grow as disciples. And the small group ministry, the idea of a small group ministry, is something we're looking to do more of as a church. It's one of the things I spoke to the search committee about, one thing we kind of saw in common. So we're looking for ways that we can sit together, learn together, listen together, because then we can hear the voice of Jesus, the voice of the Spirit speaking into our lives, and not just speaking into our current lives, but calling us into the future. We don't know what the future will look like. We don't know what First Christian Church will look like in 20 or 50 or 100 years, but we can trust that we will go into the future with Jesus, with the Spirit, and with each other. So let's not be worried and distracted about what we should be doing as a church. Instead, let us listen to Jesus whose voice we hear in the gathered community. And maybe you sometimes hear it from me, but let's be honest, there's a lot more wisdom in this room than just Tim. So let's listen to that voice we hear and then follow it, follow that voice into the future together. Amen.